Okay, are we ready to get started? Awesome. Welcome, everybody. I'm Frederique Irwin, the CEO of the National Women's History Museum. For nearly 30 years, the museum has sought to uncover and share the stories of women's history and accomplishments. Today's discussion pertains to living history and is particularly relevant as it involves a call to action for all women to make the world a better place. But before we start, I want to take a moment to recognize that tonight we are gathering in a historic synagogue. Please join me in remembering that many of us have heavy hearts at this time. Collectively, we believe in nonviolence and we grieve for all the innocent lives lost. I am pleased to introduce you to Kathy Spiller. Kathy is the executive editor of Ms. and editor of and contributor to 50 Years of Ms., the best of the pathfinding magazine that ignited a revolution. She is also the executive director and one of the founders of Feminist Majority Foundation and Feminist Majority, national organizations working for women's equality, empowerment, and nonviolence. Thank you, Kathy, for your opening remarks. Thank you, Frederic. And thanks to the National Women's History Museum for including me in this evening's program. I'm thrilled to be here with Diane Rosenfeld, Ashley Judd, Fatima Gosgraves, and Amanda Wynn. You each remind us that our journey towards a safer, more equitable society is not one we walk alone. Advocates like Diane Rosenfeld provide the legal foundation and the strategic knowledge to address systemic gender violence. At the same time, organizations like RISE, under the visionary leadership of Amanda Wynn, ensure that the rights of sexual assault survivors are at the forefront of policy and change. The diligent advocacy work of Fatima Goss Graves and the National Women's Law Center shows that our voices can break barriers and instigate real change. And the courageous revelations of women like Ashley Judd give women and survivors the knowledge that speaking out can lead to real change. We are also paying tribute. I'm also I'd like to just do a quick shout out to Yudit Zinigman, uh, working globally to promote empowerment, self-defense, and Ellen Snortland, who is here from Los Angeles, um, which is where I'm based, a feminist journalist and author of Beauty Bites Beast. For 50 years, Ms. has played a pivotal role in bringing feminism and women's rights into the mainstream in the U.S. And if you hadn't heard, and Frederick just mentioned, that we just published an anthology, 50 Years of Ms., the pathfinding magazine that ignited a revolution. The New York Times has aptly called it, quote, an illustrated guide to toppling the patriarchy. The collection of articles... <laughs> The collection of articles in the book shows how the movement for women's equality and its ideas, the problems women face in the U.S. and globally, and the solutions the movement has advocated have evolved over the past 50 years, including how Ms. has played a pivotal role in raising awareness and changing the culture's understanding of violence against women. In one of its earliest issues, Ms. explored gender-based violence and rape. In 1976, when intimate partner violence was considered a personal family matter, we ran a shocking photo on the cover of a battered, bruised women's face, the first national magazine to do so, with the headline, The Truth About Battered Wives, revealing some one-third of women are subjected to violence by intimate partners. In 1985, following a three-year study on college campuses, interviewing 7,000 women students at 35 schools, Ms. coined the term date rape and issued a report on the story of the epidemic and those who deny it, revealing that 52% of women students describe being sexually assaulted. In 1990, Ms. ran an article introducing the word femicide to describe the murders of women by men motivated by hatred, contempt, and a sense of ownership of women. In that issue, the magazine also ran the names of hundreds of women who were murdered in the United States by women in just the previous four years. 
a groundbreaking article in 2022 lays out the urgent case for the Equal Rights Amendment in order to reverse the Supreme Court's decisions that struck down the section of the Violence Against Women Act that had established the right of women to sue for civil damages. As of today, women have no constitutional right to be free from violence in the United States. And as Diane explains in her book, women have no right to challenge male sexual violence at the highest level of the law, the Supreme Court. And this summer, we ran a major feature on Diane's new book and her groundbreaking work to define patriarchal violence and the concept of collective self-defense. Over its 50 years, Ms. has helped to drive both the legal and the cultural changes the movement has achieved in the drive to reach equality and to end the use of violence to dominate and subjugate women. On the launch of the magazine, one of its co-founding editors thought, if we just explained the problem clearly enough, people would understand. They would understand the injustice of discrimination against women, and then it would just go away. While this underestimated how entrenched misogyny and racism were and still are in the US culture, legal and political institutions, Ms. has proved that naming and explaining are really vital first steps towards gender equality. And Ms. promises to remain at the forefront of changing policy and informing culture in the long struggle for gender equality and with partners like the National Women's History Museum, the National Women's Law Center, RISE, and the brilliant minds with Diane Rosenfeld and courageous advocates like Ashley Judd, I remain hopeful that we can, at long last, fortify our defense against patriarchal violence. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Before we get started in our panel discussion, and you guys are in for a treat, I'm going to do some introductions of these incredible panelists. I'm gonna make them a little bit brief, not because their bios are brief, actually quite the contrary, but just to enable us to get the conversation started. I'll start with humanitarian and actor Ashley Judd, who played an instrumental role in the Me Too movement, is an advocate for sexual and reproductive rights, and is a global advocate for women's rights. Something you may not know about Ashley is that at the University of Kentucky in 1986, she met a beloved black woman named Barbara who worked at her sorority. Ashley credits Barbara for teaching her liberation theology about structural racism and the way systems perpetuate impunity. She also credits Barbara for launching her into a life of acti activism and will be dedicating her next book to Barbara. Next to Ashley, we have author and founding director of Harvard Law School's gender violence program, Diane Rosenfeld. She is a lecturer who has taught at Harvard Law School since 2005. Diane has spent two decades creating innovative approaches to pre preventing intimate partner violence through a, excuse me, through a reconceptualization of rights and accountability. As she said in 1994, domestic violence homicide is so predictable as to be preventable. Much of her work has been animated by that principle. Her new book, The Bonobo Sisterhood, Revolution Through Female Alliance, offers a new roadmap for gender equality. Welcome, Diane. Fatima Goss-Graves, CEO of the National Women's Law Center, whose work extends to the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, is a nationally recognized leader in the fight for gender justice and an expert in law, policy, and culture change. Fatima was the groundbreaking leader who guided us with policy and legal reform through the early days of Me Too. But what Fatima remembers most vividly from that time is the community that formed, not just online, but the many women who gathered for the first time and the solidarity offered by the framework of Me Too in whispers and in shouts. Welcome, Fatima. <laughs> the 
Last but certainly not least, Amanda Wynn is the founder and CEO of RISE and 2019 Nobel Peace Prize nominee. She is a social entrepreneur, social, civil rights activist, and her organization, RISE, is a nonprofit dedicated to advocating for the rights of sexual assault survivors. Through RISE, she successfully championed the groundbreaking Sexual Assault Survivor Bill of Rights at the federal and state levels. Following RISE's multi-year global campaign, the UN General Assembly adopted the first ever standalone resolution for, the sur for survivors during peacetime. In 2021, she sparked the Stop Asian Hate Movement after calling for increased media attention to combat violence against Asian Americans. And last year, she was named one of Time's Women of the Year. Welcome, Amanda. I'm gonna frame our conversation and then come sit with you guys. In recent times, the world has once again been inundated with harrowing tales of sexual assault and harassment. From the glitz of Hollywood to the corridors of power in Washington, D.C., and even the fields of the Women's World Cup. These stories have resonated deeply, sparking a global outcry. It makes us wonder, are we witnessing the resurgence of the Me Too movement? How will its trajectory shape the future? And most importantly, what steps can be taken to bring about tangible change? Tonight, as you will notice, you have each received a copy of Diane's new book, The Bonobo Sisterhood. This book offers more than just observations. It presents a compelling call to action for a feminist alliance. In our discussion, we will explore the solutions and the path forward laid out in its pages. Diane. Yes, I'm gonna Fred. start with you. Okay. So, to truly understand our present landscape, and also because as the National Women's History Museum, we're kind of, we care about history, um, talk to us a little bit about the present landscape and the urgency of the moment. Can you take us back and provide a historical perspective on the socio-cultural and political events that have led us to this pivotal moment in this fight against sexual assault and harassment? Sure. That's, that's not a complicated or long question <laughs> in 25 words or less. First, let me say, Fred, you have been amazing at putting this event together, and I'm so honored to be here with my Bonobo sisters, and this is the Bonobo Sisterhood, so thank you, and thank you all for coming out tonight and supporting us. Um, this, is, this is a great evening and will mean a lot to me in my life's history. So... Historically, it's really important to put it into perspective because legal history shows us that the law is completely patriarchal. And when we keep going to the law for changes, we're going to lose because the law is made by and structured by propertied white men who literally wrote themselves into the law as our kings. I can prove this. In Blackstone's commentaries, which were from the 17th century, where he encoded a, in a treatise the laws. He notes that the difference between a man killing his wife and a wife killing her husband is as follows. If a man kills his wife, legally it was the same as if he had killed a stranger. If a woman killed her husband, it was an act of treason for which she would be put to death. That's your legal history lesson for tonight. Um, treason is when you go up against your country, which is led by a king. Men literally wrote themselves into the law as kings of their own castle, which let them not ever intervene in another man's violence in his castle. So that's why there's no intervention by law enforcement in domestic violence, for example, because it's against like, the whole background of the law. So we need a new system, and that's where the Bonobo Sisterhood comes in. The Bonobo Sisterhood, so to explain just very briefly about bonobos, for those of you who might not be too familiar with them, bonobos are a type of primate that share with us 98.7% of our DNA, 
like chimpanzees, but unlike chimpanzees, they are nonviolent, and bonobo females protect one another from aggressive males. And I'll explain this a little bit more as we go on, but the point about bonobos to keep in mind is that evolutionarily, they have eliminated male sexual coercion because they stick together. They form female alliances to protect one another from male sexual coercion, and the males don't use sexual coercion because it doesn't work. Someone said to me when I was explaining this to her, how do they procreate? And I was like, I'm so sorry to hear you ask that question. But it was really like, anyway. <laughs> We're jumping ahead. We're jumping ahead. <laughs> We're jumping ahead a little bit. So I will just say that bonobos are living proof that patriarchy is not inevitable. Thank you. OK. <laughs> Ashley. I want to ask you something. We often say that history is not only in the long ago past, but living history is just as important to understand. As an activist and humanitarian, you've used your voice during the Me Too movement and beyond to create incredible change. Tell us where you think we are today. Thank you. Good evening. A couple people from the South. Washington, D.C. used to be considered <laughs> Southern anyway. Let's try that again. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, to my sisters, it's good to be in fellowship with you. And I just want to augment something that Diane said. You know, this idea that because something has always been a certain way, it's supposed to be that way, is called the naturalistic fallacy. And that male dominance and male sexual coercion are just the way things are is a naturalistic fallacy as proven out by the bonobos. And I love your t-shirt. She has her t-shirt with the, with the bonobo DNA we share. Um, She's from Friends of Bonobo. Yes. So I appreciate the question. And as I've been reflecting on it, my reality is that we live in a mixed reality. We've made a lot of progress. And there is still a lot of male sexual violence. And an example is the 2017 Women's March, during which across the country, 3.3 to 4.4 million women and people participated in these marches coming together in Bonobo Sisterhood without knowing that's what they were doing. And I gave a <coughs> little speech uh, <laughs> called Nasty Woman, written by Nina Donovan. And you know, for those of us to whom it meant something, it was impactful. You know, for some people it was life enhancing at a time when we felt we were dying. And yet um, I had a big advertising job at the time and they fired me. They fired me. He said it, he was elected in large part by white women. I said it, quoting him, and I lost a job that changed like, you know, my life and my income for the rest of my life. So that's the mixed reality in which we live. I mean, women coming up to me at the Oakland airport sobbing, thank you so much, and then, you know, termination. Also, a, a, an indication to me that we've come far is that I was watching a Kentucky basketball game with my chosen family, as I do, and my bonus niece wanted to talk about pornography, including in front of the eight-year-old. And It was so important for her to bring it up because the boys at school are asking for the girls to perform sex acts that they're learning from violent, misogynistic, racist pornography. When else would a young woman at that age in front of her parents want to bring that up? You know, she needed and wanted to be heard, and she knew that I was her person, and, you know, we were going to hit pause. Um, another thing that comes to mind is that you know, in Nashville, we have a, a model sexual assault center, and we'd love to go upstream and see from whence this violence comes and eliminate that. But right now, we are still in response mode. And Diane rightly calls it, it's not intimate partner violence, it's male temper syndrome. <laughs> Sorry. You know, she's not a battered woman. He has a temper problem. Um, language matters. And I was speaking at the fundraiser for the Na Nashville Sexual Assault Center, and this man sitting next to me, who was a big donor, said, how did your partner and you meet? And I said, oh, we met in the Central African Rainforest in the bush. And he goes, oh, what a visual. At the Sexual Assault Center annual <laughs> dinner. So I immediately got up, went over to my table of chosen family, predominantly female, with their partners, told them all about it. And when I got up on stage and made my talk, I told the story. 
<laughs> Squirming like vermin, as we would say in this. Because today we tell the truth. And with, especially with these female alliances, it reduces our fear of the retaliation that may or may not come. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Fatima, <laughs> you're leading one of the most important gender justice organizations in the nation, the National Women's Law Center, which houses both the National Center for Gender Equity and the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. I'd love to hear more about your perspective of where we've been since the Me Too movement went viral. I'm still struck by Ashley's story because um, in, in so many ways, uh, the story that you told Ashley around understanding there would be a table of loved ones who received your story and supported you in a room that was outraged rather than laughed in that moment, um, I, I think about the, the shifts we have made culturally. You know, Me Too went viral only six years ago. Mm. It's kind of in its infancy yeah. in, in many ways. Um, and in that time, we have seen uh, sort of rocket ship style change. There were periods where it was difficult to keep track of the ways in which our culture was shifting, the ways in which our laws were changing, the ways in which institutional norms were changing. And when we take stock of it, again, only six years, but when we take stock of it, I can look back at these last six years and see things that, um, that are almost shocking to me. I can see and think about the 25 states that have changed their laws in these last six years. I can think about the way in which we moved from sexual violence being a thing culturally that was only discussed really in the shadows. Now, you know, not for polite company, certainly not for main stage, uh, to a movement of folks united in sisterhood, um, fighting for change and believing something different could happen. And, you know, if we had plotted to be ready for this precise moment, I don't know that we could have imagined the way um, Ashley's bravery would have resonated. I don't know that we would have imagined the way people were inspired by the many people who were coming together in that way. I don't know that I would have guessed that people who said that institutions could not change, that those institutions would actually change. I, you know, so sometimes when I think about the arc of of these last six years, I feel lucky to be able to sit back and have a little perspective that we were lucky enough to live in this moment mm -hmm. where we got to see this sort of change. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Ashley, for getting it started. Um, Amanda, <laughs> through your activism and leadership at RISE, you've helped pass nearly 80, can we just pause for a second, 80 <laughs> laws across states and in Congress, and most recently, after years of lobbying, witnessed the UN pass a historic resolution on justice for sexual assault survivors. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been seeing in terms of why these laws and resolutions are necessary, and why solidarity is more critical than ever? I think that when I see survivors like myself write in and say that they have hope, not only because of the laws that we've been able to pass, but because they see people who look like me be able to do that, it is what keeps me going. To be honest with you, when I first started, I was just filled with rage. That's how I got through. I was so mad that 
the criminal justice system would treat survivors the way that it does. In my case, you know, I found out that my rape kit would be destroyed at six months untested, even if the statute of limitations is 15 years in Massachusetts. And you know, I, when I spoke out about my story, so many other survivors had written in or shared with me their own problems, you know, that um, some of them were charged for their rape kits and cost up to $2,000. If they couldn't pay it, they had creditors call their homes. That's how their family members found out. Um, in some cases, the survivor was the one that was thrown into jail because they were afraid that they wouldn't be a witness, you know. Um, in what I think is so dehumanizing is that the process itself makes the survivor, again, a mere witness to the crime that is our bodies. Mm -hmm. How many people actually know the names of survivors in very famous cases? We know the names of the men who have hurt us. Um, and, you know, in the criminal justice system, we don't even pass the Bechdel test, right? So I wanted to take that back, um, and I wanted the system to just be a little more fair, um, to be trauma-informed. Um, I, I think in terms of the trends that I've seen, there is certainly a lot of hope. Because I'll say one thing, that rage runs out, you know? And for me, after a while, it was hope that sustained it when we were able to move that needle forward. With every meeting that we got, with every law that we've been able to pass, um, the first time that I actually fought for my rights and told my story, it was many hours of politicians telling me, like, hey, you know, I sympathize, but this isn't going to help me win my re-election. And I was like, wow, that's really honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks. And I went <laughs> home, <laughs> and I cried, and um, I was just like, I just need someone to tell me they love me. And then the next morning, I got up, and as a pathological optimist, which is necessary in activism, <laughs> um, I got up the next day and I went to the U.S. Senate and in my Uber ride, I you know, met this driver who um, was kind of intimidating, didn't really talk to me, but he saw that I was going to the Senate, so he asked me why I was going and I told him and um, he started crying. He was a complete stranger and he turned to me and he said, my daughter was also raped and what you went through, she also went through too. And when he stopped the car, he said, can I shake your hand? Thank you so much for fighting for her. Mm -hmm. um, has anyone told you that they love you today? I love you. Uh -huh. And I think that that is the trend that I've seen, that if we manifest it, it can be possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. incredible. Thank you. So, Diane, I know, now that we have some history, some context, perspective, I want to talk a little bit about your book, Okay, The Bonobo Sisterhood. Um, it focuses on how, as humans, we can collectively eliminate sexual assault and patriarchal violence by using concepts from the society, the matriarchal society of the bonobos. So for some people tonight, this might be the first time that they're hearing about the Bonobo Sisterhood. So can you start us off by talking a little bit about what is the Bonobo Sisterhood and what is the framework that it provides for all the women and men here tonight? Sure. What you see here is actually the Bonobo Sisterhood. And what I was saying before is about how bonobos protect one another. So now let me explain that a little bit. If a female bonobo was aggressed upon by a male, she would let out a special cry. Will you do a bonobo cry for me? Jane Goodall makes fun of my bonobo cry. <laughs> I'm going to respect Jane and keep okay. quiet. Okay. Richard, <laughs> Richard Rangham says that my bonobo cry is perfect, but Ashley has seen bonobos in the wild in the Congo, and I have not. Huh? Ish. <laughs> I think that was great. Thank you. Okay, so a bonobo makes a cry like that. If she's aggressed upon, 
and all other females within earshot, all of them, whether they know her, like her, or are related to her, come immediately to her aid. They form an instantaneous coalition, and they fend off the male, sometimes sending him into isolation. And then he comes back into the troop, and they all make up, and they get along. And evolutionarily, as I said, they have eliminated male sexual coercion. Just think what it would be like if human females got over our patriarchal divisions among each other, and we came to each other's aid. When we heard a bonobo call, and when you tune your ear, you hear bonobo calls all over. You read the newspaper, you hear your friends, you look at your family. Bonobo calls are alarms going off in all houses, but we just don't listen. But we can listen now because we know there's something that we can do that will work. This is accessible. It's as easy as just deciding you're going to be a bonobo the next day. A bonobo means you come to somebody else's aid, whether you know them, you like them, or you are related to them. And what that means for we humans who have been socialized in a patriarchy is that we stop consciously judging one another based on our divisions, because we participate in this, right? And we look at somebody and we say, oh, I don't like how she's dressed. And we divide ourselves. We divide amongst ourselves. And instead of saying that, say to yourself, that might not be my fashion choice, but I absolutely defend her right to wear whatever she wants because she's my sister. Mm -hmm. The bonobos operate on a principle that is as follows. And if you agree with the two parts of this principle, you are part of the bonobo sisterhood, no matter what your gender. OK? First part. Nobody has the right to harm my sister. And by harm, I mean pimp, exploit, assault, gaslight, dominate, harass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No one has the right to do that to my sister. Everybody agree with that? OK. We're in. All right, you're, you're in. Two, everybody's my sister. <laughs> That's the bonobo sister. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you just mentioned, Ashley, you've spent some time in the Congo, actually over a decade, right? And what are, I, I'm, I think, can you share with us some of the behaviors that um, you've observed and what it's taught you about women's autonomy? Sure, thank you. Uh, just feeling a lot of joy at being here right now. That was beautiful. <laughs> Diane was my professor when I was at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and I went to, over to the law school, and that's how we met. I took her gender violence law and social justice. 2010. Class. Yeah. 2010. This yeah. is my girl. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started visiting the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2008, and it was pretty shattering. I was doing public health work, family planning, long-lasting insecticide malaria nets, and of course, male sexual violence, which is particularly in the East, very um, devastating. But I also like to say that you know, a woman who can't say no to sex is experiencing a form of violence. And just to, just to say this, you know, women all over the world, I've been to 23 countries so far, don't know if I'm going to make it to Syria in November, as planned. Um, but they live in terror of their next pregnancy because they don't have the autonomy to plan space the births of their children or to say no to sex when the man comes home or whenever. So the cool thing about being with bonobos in the rainforest is that if a female, say, is sitting on some majestic tree branch in the canopy and a male decides he may want to copulate with her, he'll go her way, you know, solicit. <laughs> She'll seem like she's considering it. And if she doesn't want to, she signals no, and he just ambles away. <laughs> End of story. And he sits and pouts. Um, no, he doesn't. There's no, there's no reaction whatsoever. And so, you know, one of the things that when Diane was saying about how female bonobos help each other, we can measure through observation and data collection of saliva and you know, fruits that drop that have saliva, the cortisol levels of females when they're with each other and their peace hormones go up. And we measure it also by how much they groom each other, how much they play, and how much they share valuable resources. So um, it's really amazing. And, and of course, they don't have tails. They're not monkeys. But when the male comes back from having been corrected, he'd have his tail between his legs if he had one. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's just a little bit about, I mean, they're spiritual, they're delightful. I weep every morning when I'm sitting under the tree looking at the nest where they've made their nest the night before and they start to wake up. It's just extraordinary. And this is full reproductive autonomy. This is full reproductive autonomy. It's what it looks like and it, and it exists. 100% of all female chimpanzees are severely meet, beaten and sexually aggressed by males. But here we are so closely related. You know, a bonobo, when she sees us, sees a closer relative than when she looks at a gorilla. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very fortunate to be welcomed into the rainforest. I love the people of Kokolapori <laughs> who let me be there. That's gorgeous. Okay. Thank you. Fatima, you and I, the other day, we were talking about the need for hope in today's world. And many who learn about the bonobos um, or read Diane's book genuinely feel a sense of hope. And as you know, the bonobo sisterhood emphasizes the need for female alliances. There's a unique force that comes together when alliances join up to fight for progress. I'm wondering how you see alliances and cross movements, not just domestically, but even internationally, working collectively to bring justice. What does that look like? Yeah, I, it's funny. When Diane first told me she was writing the book, and I said, what is Bonobos? And she says, it's us. It's all of us. So I, I um, appreciate that reminder always. If, if it's OK, I'm going to give two examples Please. that I think help situate it. One, one it, I think, is um, the story of the founding of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund because women were gathering everywhere. And sometimes it was quiet gathering, but they were gathering and talking and strategizing. And that was happening uh, in the entertainment industry in the same way it was happening around the world, really. And, uh, you know, my bonobo sister, Monica Ramirez, <laughs> Uh, who at the time was leading an organization um, that advocated on behalf of farm worker women, pinned a, a letter in solidarity and said, we're ready to march with you. And said this sort of beautiful analogy about the experiences that farm worker women um, were experiencing sexual violence in the shadows and unseen and feeling a, a, a deep kinship with women in entertainment. And they said, also, unseen, this violence, we're your sisters. And the way that folks come together and the way Time's Up Legal Defense Fund was built was with that in mind. It was with the ability to build something that went across for women working across sectors but really a deep focus on those who had the least amount of resources to fight back in a shared sisterhood. So it's not an accident that 75% of the people who come through Time's Up Legal Defense Fund identify as low income. Hmm. That, that's a, a, by design. Uh, and that circle of love and support is sort of in its bones. But the other thing I just want to say, because even globally, like when Me Too went viral, the framework that, you know, Tarana gifted us, um, it, it was a global conversation. And, but that's not the only global conversation happening. We talk a lot about how on the right, there's actually this pretty well coordinated and centrally funded um, coordination that is around, you know, sometimes people call it anti-gender. There are lots of names of it, but it has enabled an acceleration of cultural and, and laws to constrain the rights of women, to constrain um, gender identity more broadly. Uh, and it's happening in the United States, it's happening around the world, and I would say that the United States can be very good at not looking up to notice that things are happening around the world. Um, and then you get something like the Dobbs decision. Um, and something happens here that everyone thought could never happen here. You know, even in the months before Dobbs was decided, 
I would say to people, this is the year the Supreme Court overturns Roe. And you, like, the air would leave the room because people didn't believe it was possible. And it happened. And the acceleration in learning that actually has to happen now is the work that has been happening led by our sisters in Latin America, led by our sisters who'd been organizing deeply in Europe, who had been thinking outside of the law, had been organizing differently, had been forcing a cultural shift that wasn't happening in the same way in the United States. And now there are more on purpose pockets of shared learning and growing together across far more than, you know, lots of arguments that maybe that should have always been happening. But I see it coming together in ways that feel powerful. And I even see it happening outside of the space where folks work on gender. Interesting. That gives me hope. Thank you <laughs> for sharing that. Um, Amanda, you've called the Bonobo Sisterhood a sisterhood to whom I owe my justice, success, and healing today. Can you share a little bit about your own story? And more importantly, why, why do you say this? And how does sisterhood show up in your daily life today and in your work? I remember walking out of the hospital after my procedure, which was six hours long. Most people don't know that rape kits can take three to seven hours long. And I'd never more fully understood the definition of lonely than at that moment. I went, this is before me too, and I went back to the place where I was raped, my dorm room, and I didn't know who to reach out to for help. I did, though, know that through one of my sorority sisters that there was somebody else who was also a survivor. And I reached out to her, and she and other survivors told me that on the Harvard campus there was an angel of the law. There was a professor who helped people like us. And they said, do you want to meet her? And so I said, yes, please. And I remember going and sitting in her room, very scared. And she said, everything's going to be OK. My name is Diane Rosenthal. <laughs> So I really do owe everything to you, to the Bonobo Sisterhood, um, and all those 80 laws. Please <laughs> consider that you wrote them too. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example for the last part of your question. When I fought for my rights in Massachusetts, I was living in DC at the time, and um, it was the day before the legislative session would close. The bill had not yet been put onto the agenda to be voted on, and as I was sitting in the airport about to fly to Massachusetts to try to save my rape kit, to try to get this bill that I had written, um, thanks to the help of Diane, um, I got a call and they said, hey, uh, we're so sorry, but the speaker is not going to bring up your bill for a vote. And I felt devastated. You know, I was like, what's even the point in showing up in Massachusetts if I'm just going to watch my rights fail? And it was another survivor who said, Amanda, just show up there, stand outside the door of the State House floor and make every single member have to cross your face as they walk out. And I was the last person that was on that flight. And when I landed in Boston, it was other survivors who said, OK, well, let's do this. And for over 10 hours straight, we knocked door to door, and we said, 
hey, I'm a survivor, this is what I'm fighting about, there's this bill, can you please convince the speaker to put it onto the agenda? And at the end of those 10 hours, the speaker did put it on the agenda because of us, and it passed unanimously. Wow. Awesome. Can, you, can you share the story um, that you told me about Fashion Week and the UN? Because that's also a remarkable story of Female Alliance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the United Nations, um, over the past several years, uh, part, as part of you know, COVID protocols, restricted civil society from entering the headquarters building. And we had been fighting for six years for a United Nations General Assembly resolution to recognize a very basic set of rights for survivors in peacetime. We thought to ourselves, okay, well, how can we have our voices heard if we can't literally be in the building still? And so we thought, okay, we're gonna use art. Um, the UN is split into five regional groups of the world. And so we are made of survivors from around the world, and each one of us from a region of the world put the outfit that we were assaulted on on these mannequins, and we put them in the lobby of the UN. <laughs> so even if we couldn't be there, our outfits would be there. Amazing. And we forced the diplomats to run into these outfits as they went on their daily work commute. Uh, and it worked wonders. Um, the President of the General Assembly, the um, Deputy Secretary General um, really learned about our work. And New York Fashion Week and, um, and the United Nations General Assembly overlap in time. And so we thought, okay, how are we gonna stand out when literally the entire world is asking these heads of states to care about their issue? How can we have our voices heard? We thought, what do diplomats really like that they don't get to go to? And we're like, oh, maybe it's sitting front row at New York Fashion Week. So <laughs> what we did was we threw New York Fashion Week's first ever Survivor Fashion Show. And it was around the question, what were you wearing? Mm. You know, celebrities get asked all the time mm -hmm. on the red carpet, I love what you're wearing. Who are you wearing? What are you wearing? And um, that's the same question that survivors get asked, and it's the complete opposite intention. You know, it's shaming you for the violence that happened to you. So we had survivors walk the runway. We put those mannequins and we lined them the in the runway. And we um, paired each survivor and celebrity ally who walked um, with designers who let, loaned us these outfits to make everyone feel great about what they were wearing. And we invited all these diplomats. And they came, um, and we confirmed 25 votes on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. Thank you. Whew. Yeah. This is a hard job you gave me, Diane. <laughs> You're, I wouldn't have given it to you if you weren't worthy of the task. Um, well, we've talked a little bit about how alliances can have these incredible outcomes. But I want to make sure that our audience tonight walks out not only inspired, but really clear on how to activate alliances. And in your book, there's a topic that you really talk a lot about, which is a self worth defending. And I want you to share with us what you mean and how does that weave into an understanding of applying the framework and principles? Okay, first of all, her, her gown that she wore at Fashion Week was designed by... Partly me and many other designers. Yeah. And then other designers, and it had the words of the laws that she, the federal law that she crafted and got passed. So, yeah. <laughs> it was just fantastic. Okay. Um, Gloria Steinem said, the great Gloria Steinem, leader of Ms. and our movement, um, said the most important thing about self-defense is knowing you have a self-worth defending. If anybody in reading the book, the first four chapters are a little heavy, and if you're feeling that they're heavy, 
this is your trigger warning, just skip ahead to, you have my permission to skip ahead to chapter six, because that's the uplift, that's the self-worth defending. You all have, have a self-worth defending. We don't learn that. Nobody tells us that we have selves worth defending and that we can defend ourselves rather than giving out our protection to men. Because from what do we need male protection? Other men. <laughs> Thank you. So that framework, that, that structure sets us up to lose because it sets up men to decide, as I said, who among us is worthy of protection. We are all worthy of protection. I'm very excited that my fairy godmother, um, Kathy, has put me in touch with Judith and Arlene, who work in the global empowerment self-defense space, to know the importance of not just self-defense, but a collective self-defense. Bonobos have figured this out. They have a collective self-defense. And once you take self-defense, how many of you have taken self-defense? <laughs> okay, a, a good smattering, um, a little higher than the usual crowd, but this is, <laughs> this is great. You all need to take self-defense. And it's not because I'm victim blaming ever, it's because when you, you learn that you have the power within your body to defend yourself, and that wakes you up to the notion that you are worth defending, and then it makes you much more capable of defending your sisters. And then you can listen to the bonobo call and just stand besides your sisters. And that's what's gonna change everything, okay? I totally appreciate that you're not tired of law. I'm so like sick of law, but I'm so inspired <laughs> by, I really, I, I am. Um, but I'm so inspired by your approaches and I'm so honored to work with the National Women's Law Center. We, we got like a small victory on a, on a Title IX case that we co-counseled. And, and not I, small. Not <laughs> narrow. A little, not, it wasn't small. It was the only one in the United States challenging the Trump Title IX rules and we got something overturned, so that's great. Um, and, and you have inspired laws and voices. I want the Bonobo Sisterhood to be the vehicle for Me Too. So Me Too has, has emboldened survivors to come forward and join together and tell their stories. And then self-defense, a collective self-defense, is what moves us to say, you can't do that to her. She's my sister. And when we do this globally, we're going to have our revolution. And our, the revolution is at hand. Bonobos are peaceful. There is no lethal violence observed among bonobos. Chimpanzee males will kill other chimpanzees in territorial disputes. Bonobos are xenophilic, which means they love strangers. Chimpanzees are xenophobic, which means they fear strangers. Look at the quote up there. Love the stranger, for you are strangers. Be bonobo. I love that. In fact, my husband read your book because oh, I've been talking about it for months. <laughs> so he read it. And the first thing he said is, we have to get self-defense classes for our daughter. Great. Yes. Great. So <laughs> I said yes. Um, one of the things I want to come back to, and Fatima, I'll ask you um, this, is the work that remains to be done and how we can use this framework and these alliances. Um, so maybe let's start perhaps as um, with the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. And can you talk a little bit more about what needs to be done to prevent workplace harassment, where you see things today, and what we can do to work together to achieve a better workplace environment? Yeah, and I just have to name that some of the folks who do the day-to-day -day work on Time's Up Legal Defense Fund are here in the audience. Where are they? Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, we've had over 5,000 people come through the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund in the last six years. And 
there was a certain period of time where we were getting a higher clip than the EEOC was in terms of charges. And so one of the things that we were able to know is a little bit about who's been coming through the fund. And there are a few things that I think we've learned from that. We've learned that people continue to unfortunately experience harassment and violence at work. And that was true during the pandemic in those earliest stages. There were, there were some folks who were making predictions that remote work would be a protection mm -hmm. against discrimination and harassment. And it turns out abusers find ways to engage in harassment. Uh, and so that was not true. Um, just new means and settings and, and lots of people who were always frontline workers who were more vulnerable in that period. Um, we've learned that lots of people just aren't protected. And so in some ways I'm with you, Diane. I, like, I'm frustrated by the law because the law has so many limits. I mean, the laws have been on the books for a lot of places for a long time, and folks act like they're surprised, surprised when Me Too went viral that they had to do something different, right? So <laughs> I, I, in some ways, I'm frustrated by the law. But in other ways, I think about the many people who try to come through the fund, and the law's limits mean that there's nothing they can do within it, that maybe they aren't covered at all, or they did not come forward fast enough, or there were a range of unfair things that were put in place in their workplaces that really meant sort of the silencing of them. And so we've been working to try to change that, right? Working to cover more people, working to ensure that the sort of silencing tactics are illegal. Um, but there's, there's still obviously work to go. And then I have to say the cultural piece of this, that our laws will continue to change. I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm an optimist too, and in ways where people are like, why do you believe it? I'm like, why don't you believe it? <laughs> Lots of things are possible, right? But it will take a long time, and the work of culture making, of storytelling, both in a big way that sort of breaks through to everyone, but the one-on-one -on -one stories that are told at kitchen tables and in classrooms, um, that is going to make a difference around those new norms so that more people understand that um, that we can be a protection force. I see the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, the many people who raise their hand to be lawyers, to share stories, to support people coming through the fund as a part of a protection force. That's how I think of them. Um, but I also want every person to feel like they are a part of that, that they have joined something bigger in this time, in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's how I think we'll see change. Thank you. I'm curious, Ashley, you mentioned earlier how broadly you've traveled. Mm -hmm. And I am wondering how you would answer that question. Where do you see room for more alliances and sisterhoods? And conversely, where do you see things working already remarkably well that maybe we don't know about? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think an example like Sudan and the pro-democracy movement that was happening, women were integral to that. They were kith and kin and waft and weave, and then the men didn't include them in the negotiating process. And what the data show, particularly from a scholar like Erica Chenoweth at the Harvard Kennedy School, she holds the First Amendment chair, and her partner Zoe, is that when women are involved, um, and get to the negotiating table and help create and execute the, the PACs, it pushes off authoritarian regimes. But when women are not included and those authoritarian regimes are installed, the backlash against women is particularly severe. Wow. So, um, and then I, I just want to give a, a couple of little examples too, because I can really only speak from my own experience. My partner and I were on a train in Boston and 
a man aggressed against a woman, and she said, I don't put up with that crap, and she shoved him or stood up for her physically in some way, her self-defense, and he began to beat her with closed fists. And it was a melee on this train. I mean, bodies flying, and I just stood up and started to, be and it doesn't make me good, right, and perfect, it just means I'm a bonobo. But I stood up and started to bellow at the top of my lungs, get that man off that woman. And I just repeated myself at the highest volume, and um, nobody else did anything. It totally paralyzed, except for my partner, he's a legend, and he got hands on that guy by the scruff of his neck and pulled him off three different times. You know, and she was a younger black woman and he was an older white man, and, but if that had been reversed, we think it would have played out very differently. Okay. So you gotta have skin in the game, is mm -hmm. part of what I'm saying. You have to have skin in the game, and, and pay attention to your sisters, and listen, and, and think of them, like, you know, I was brought into Time's Up by Brie Larson because people were getting together at her house and this is when it was groups of two and three and four and I live in Tennessee, I don't live in Hollywood. And she said, you may want to come out for this and I started traveling to, you know, because she pulled me in. And those are, those are interpersonal examples but I think that they are the catalyst for the, for the broader collective change. Um, you know, and also in Kokolapuri, which I mentioned, UNFPA and I are able to start a maternal health clinic. Unplanned pregnancy is very high maternal health. Maternal mortality is going up in DRC. Child early enforcement, I mean, it's sex and labor slavery is what it is. And when we came in with UNFPA, the men all stood up and said what they wanted from UNFPA, which is the United Nations Agency for Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. The women stood up and told their stories for the first time. Uh -huh. They stood under the tree. And they said, you know, let me tell you the story of the young girl. She's raped. She gets pregnant. A, a man rapes her. I'd like to know from whence this rape comes. A man rapes her. She um, is thrown out by her family, tells that story. The, the married woman and the widow, you know, her husband dies. The family comes in, takes all her possessions. She has no... They and, and, you know, you clap after everyone speaks in the Congo. So all the men are clapping after they hear this story, <laughs> these, you know, about, about their violence. And um, it was... I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I've, because we're split, as Diane said, like in the brothels in India where the women are living four to a room where men are paying to rape them with their children under the beds, they're isolated from each other. But that is changing. That is changing. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we still have a lot of progress to make, though. Forward momentum still. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it starts with individual voice. You know, it starts with the up, with, you have to identify the up with which you will not put in the hill on which you are willing to die. And love for that. me, this is it. I love that. Thank you. I want to keep an eye on time so we have a little bit of time for questions. But Amanda, um, I think it's really important before we move to Q&A that we talk a little bit about your work with, against the, a, um, I'm sorry, the AAPI community and specifically kind of what you did with Stop Asian Hate. Can you talk a little bit about that initiative and where you see things today and really what, how can we apply some of these bonobo principles to come together um, to make improvements there? Yeah, um, I was mad and I turned on my camera and I asked people to stop Asian Hate. I actually thought I would lose a lot of followers for doing this. Um, and it went viral, um, you know, the, the next business day, um, a reporter, White House, uh, you know, reporter asked Jen Psaki if President Biden had seen my video, and then, um, and then he made a speech mentioning it, and, you know, our call to action was to have our stories be heard and, and to be reported. I remember I was on CNN and this one reporter apologized for not reporting about it and I was really caught off guard because I didn't realize, oh wow, like this is making a difference. Um, but I think that for us, absolutely, this framework of alliance is so critical for all social movements. You know, allies are so important and at least for Stop Asian Hate, for us, the next frontier is the intersection of race and gender. Yes. You know, if we look at the statistics of who experienced that violence, 
um, some cite that over 70% of the hate crimes that are directed toward the AAPI community are AAPI women, you know. Um, and for us, again, it's really about this alliance that we have um, to be able to share our stories with one another, to know that it is a value, our experiences are valuable, and also to have other people recognize the humanity. I, I think that the final thing I wanna share is, you know, a lot of the response to that viral video was that people had felt invisible before. And no one is invisible when we demand to be seen. No one is powerless when we come together. Amen. <laughs> before um, we open it up for questions, I want to ask you guys to um, dog ear page 227 in your books, <laughs> because I want to leave you with this quote. Our connection and our love for one another will be the resource that changes everything. Mm -hmm. And I hope tonight you guys have felt the love across this panel with these incredible women and their stories and their willingness to open up their hearts and their stories. And so before we open up the floor to questions, I do want to ask you guys to please remain respectful in your questions. Or we'll shut you down. <laughs> right, Ashley? <laughs> Speak up. Hi, Diane. It's good to see you. Hi, Amanda. This is a, this is a bonobo of mine. This is Amanda Reisinger, um, who was one of my squad who helped produce this book. And I could not have done this book without her. She was part of a four-person squad. She is remarkable. She is bonobo. I love her. And thank you for coming, Amanda. Good to see you. I love you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I, so I have a very, very brief story of hope um, tied to a question. Great. So after I took your class, worked with you on this book, I told my whole family about it, and <laughs> my mom bought a copy. And then she bought 25 <laughs> copies, and she gave them away to all of her friends, to women that she went to workout classes with, and <laughs> people got excited in her little hometown in Northern California. And her teacher at these workout classes said, I teach self-defense classes too. Let's see if we can get a class going at the local high school because these girls need to know about this. So it's a little story of hope, a little story of Bonobo sisterhood in a small town in California. And my question for you is what you think we can do to talk, talk about the Bonobo sisterhood, about um, self-defense, to young women and girls? How do we bring people into the sisterhood as early as possible? That's a great question. And older bonobos help younger bonobos all, right. all the time. Can I say something? Yes, that? please. So bonobos are interesting in that the female migrates out of her natal community. And when she, she starts to distance herself from her birth community, she has these kind of lonely days where she's shoulder back at her mama and she's looking off into the rainforest at the unknown territory and when she migrates and she finds another community she makes an alliance with an older bonobo and that is how she is integrated into the community they form this bond and it, you'll see it's it's so beautiful what will usually happen is the younger female bonobo will sit with the older one and she'll beg so while the older one is eating her fruits this one will just and then eventually the mama the the new Bonobo mentor will start taking food out of her mouth and put it in the young woman's, yeah. So we, we all have to talk to and take care of our younger bonobos. I have many bonobos in the audience here, one on stage. Um, our younger people and teach self-defense. And I have to say, I'm very excited about the self-defense movement. And when I went to Udit's camp, Udit is um, the founder of the Empowerment Self-Defense Global Community, and she's taken this all the self-defense organizations across the world and created an umbrella for them. And then, as I said, Kathy put us in touch, and, and I was invited generously to her, her camp this summer. 
And it's a very different movement because it has energy forward. It's like, this is something that we all can do. And it doesn't even have to be a formal self-defense class. You can go on the internet and Google self-defense for 15 minutes, and you'll still be better off than you would be if you hadn't taken any self-defense. And you can just go stand next to somebody on a subway That's right. and just you know, do what Ashley did and just keep your ear tuned to the call and know that you have the power and the right to self-defend, that you have a right to not be aggressed upon by anyone. And, and you teach it to your younger sister, and um, we just have to keep teaching our sisters and knowing that everyone's our sister. And thank you for all of your amazing bonobo leadership in this movement. Thank you. For real. Plus you get to cuss, because there is a self-defense class where you learn how to say, not today, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I swore in a temple. I apologize. <laughs> But literally, women have said that when they get big like that and use their voices, it's like, you know, they, they're expecting compliance. That's awesome. Yeah. Right. Right. I okay. just stood up. Hey. Um, Introduce yourself. Okay. Please. My name is Ellen Snortland. That's phonetically spelled <laughs> land. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't laugh at a last name like that. I mean, what can you laugh at? Um, I wanted to tell you that I've been talking about the Bonobo Sisterhood nonstop since I met Diane. And I've worked it into every conversation. I uh, testified at town council in Pasadena, California. I gave a pledge speech at the Episcopalian Church, and I had everybody grooming each other afterwards. <laughs> and it, seriously, they're like going, oh, okay. Um, anyway, but I, I wanted to, this is more of a comment than a question, and that is, um, I was attending a George Floyd um, vigil, and it was around Pasadena City Hall, which is this magnificent bridal cake kind of building, and I parked, and I heard this yelling going back and forth, back and forth between two uh, a parked car, uh, some muscle Camaro or something, and this guy, this white guy, is hanging out the window yelling at this Latina, Latino man on a bicycle, and I went, oh God, this could turn so ugly so fast and ruin this vigil, because that guy was not there to peacefully, you know, protest uh, the murder of George Floyd. So I thought, you know what, I don't see anybody stepping in, so I'm the bonobo elder here. So I walked over to the man on the bicycle and I said, come with me, just come with me. Don't look over there, stop yelling, come with me. And he just said, okay, and, uh, and he bicycled off. And that is but bonobo, yeah. because it is my community and you don't get to mess it up. Yeah. And that's what I get out of having learned to be a badass. <laughs> you know, and I, I owe it to my I owe it to my empowerment self defense community. Yeah. That's what Beauty Bites Beast is about. The documentary and the book. It's like yeah. no, it doesn't mean you have to to pound somebody. You just have the courage once you know you're a badass to go in and intervene. Right. Right. And, and stop the violence. Right. And this is all about stopping violence. Yes. We don't need violence. We can live without violence. We can live in peace. Bonobos understand this. They don't have a constitution. Mm -mm. They don't mm -mm. have laws. They just <laughs> understand this. You, you stop male sexual coercion, you have peace, you can have a peaceful society, and you can have reproductive autonomy. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to share that because it that's, didn't involve any that's force. That's right. right. Nothing. Just other intervention. Than, yeah. Thank you. Courage. Thank you, yeah. Ellen. Thank you. You're awesome. Good evening, my Hi. name is Emily, and I am proud to be from Kentucky. Flew in this oh. morning for tonight's <laughs> event. Oh, wow, um, awesome. And I, I am just truly really over, like completely overcome tonight. Um, this feels like a very life-giving and life-changing night. Um, so I'm sure there are many of us who I hear, right, there's like the sigh, like, oh, wow. Um, so you just mentioned the Constitution, 
and I wanted to share and ask a question. Um, in the state of Kentucky, we just changed our state constitution to provide and protect rights for crime victims at the constitutional level. Great. So it has been an incredible legal shift and now, three years in, an incredible cultural shift. And so um, with this work of being invited into you know, the prosecutor's conference to teach them about what crime victims' experiences are like in the justice system, because for many of them, they just have no idea. Um, and we're talking with victims and we're getting them empowered to think about asserting their rights and the fact that they have standing now to do something about it if their rights are violated. It's all very exciting. What I'm noticing is that there's so much that can be done. I'm also a pathological optimist, so I know uh, it's my job to talk about all of the ways that the legal system re-traumatizes victims. Um, and yet, each of those options and opportunities is a chance to make a difference and to do better the next time. Um, and so I'm very excited to be able to talk to the law school, University of Kentucky Law School, on Monday okay. for the first time about crime victims' experiences. And so I would like to ask you, what would be the one thing that you would want rising lawyers to know um, and to think about with regard to crime victims and their experiences? Great question. So approach it as a bonobo and get your bonobo sisterhood together and say, what, what do we want them to hear? but peel away the idea that you have to work within the system that's already structured for you because that system is structured in a way to not hear you. So you have to just like disregard it all and say, what should our role be in court? Like why does a prosecutor have to represent us and why don't we have any legal standing ourselves in the criminal justice system? Go back to the legal history thing that I said at the beginning, legal history of rape was originally a criminal trespass to property, where the woman was the property of the husband or the father, whoever owned her at the time. So we haven't, you know, our rape laws are steeped in that. They're, they're trying to reform, trying to shoehorn a reform into a system that's flawed at its base. So know that you are entitled to just reform the system and ask for the moon, and then support each other. And to create bonobo sisterhoods, like. Take out your phone and talk to strangers who are around you and change your phone numbers and, and create little sisterhoods among yourselves and just know that you have a sisterhood who will come to your aid if you, if you need them. So I will be part of your Bonobo sisterhood and be in touch. Thank you so much. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for two more questions. Sorry. Hi. Um, thank you for this panel, for organizing it, for the book. I'm looking forward to reading it. My name is Burju, and I had a question, which is kind of general, but a little difficult, I guess, to also address to all of you. I've been thinking about the question of power, which is something that feminist theory has long grappled with, what to do with it, once you get it, right? Um, so I'm thinking about how Bonobo Sisterhood would think about questions of power, how to rewire relationships of power, mm -hmm. whether to eliminate hierarchies that grant power, mm -hmm. whether to um, you know, redistribute it. So what kind of a vision of power do you have in mind? I would really appreciate learning Shlaine, about that. Thank you. Do you want to talk you. a little bit about that? Sure. So, so bonobos are this interesting uh, species that holds a complexity and duality, because they are matriarchal and yet they are egalitarian. So even though they're matriarchal and a female is always the ranking individual with the most status, which, you know, food, grooming, attention paid to her, um, resources, all of that, um, no one suffers. There's no punitivity because there is a ranking person. Everyone is treated equally and well. And it's, it might be hard for our brains to grasp that because we are so binary and either or, but they really show this um, evolutionarily based model for fairness, for fairness. You know, and you see it when, you know, Diane mentioned that when strange groups come together, they get excited. I mean, they, they get so excited they rub their genitals together. <laughs> this is a distinct bonobo behavior. We just have to acknowledge that. 
But they, I mean, they, they share food, they do the begging, they groom each other, they play like wild, and you don't see any status in that. They're not figuring out, like, who's the cool kid that I want to make sure I bond with so that I don't get my ass kicked at recess or whatever. Um, so that's something that I, would, that I would note about bonobos. And the other thing is there's the, the, the grandmother, um, what's it called, the grandmother? It's not the theory, it's the grandmother's fact where um, a, a female will protect her son if he's trying to copulate so that she can protect future generations and pass on her genetic heritage. And um, it's called the grandmother effect. And so elders are also highly valued and very important to the survival of the species. They're not discarded as just an example of how power is completely, or it's so equitable across, yeah. And I, I would say disaggregate the idea of power with violence and patriarchy, right? That's where power, you know, the language of violence is, is a powerful language. Let's disempower that, self-defend. We have to learn enough of the language of violence to defend ourselves and our sisters unapologetically and do that without permission. Yeah. Yeah, All right, we have time for one more question. But there are three more people. I know, I know. but I want to be I'll respectful of everyone's short. time. Okay. I'll make mine short. Okay. My name is Kristen Hartman. I live in Colorado, Western Colorado, <laughs> and I am a graduate school in public policy, which is I chose to do in retirement. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my friends are like, you're doing what and why? And you're going to there for a day to listen to what? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> so one of the questions that I have, I do have friends who are survivors who are afraid to speak, very quiet. I get messages from them on social media. Thank you so much. And I'm like, um, so my question would be, how can, I mean, I heard you say, you know, talk to your friends. Okay, I'm like doing that, but I, I'm not shy. <laughs> so I want to talk to more people. So is there a way that we could start in our communities, in our neighborhoods, mini bonobo groups that do meet regularly, that do compare notes? Because I have friends who are interested, but this is your book. This is your project. And I obviously want to be able to just be like, yes, everyone get this. And is there a way we can start community organizations, you know, small groups, start building in our communities so that we're starting to network these things nationwide and globally? Yes. yes. So, and I'm the one with the Lady Justice story. So. I know. I love you already, Kristen. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much for coming and Thank honoring you. us with that present. I did so, not. Yeah, we want to make groups. I did <laughs> not. I did not plant this question. <laughs> I was wondering. No, I can, I it was okay, so. <laughs> totally volunteered. So very. Wait, and I want yes. to piggyback on her question. Okay, okay you go. Since we can't ask a question, just give that. <laughs> This no. is the woman that bought the company that I sold a few years ago. Oh, sorry. She's <laughs> amazing. Hi, everybody. Hi. But to that and how you're forming, I think your question is like how you're forming us on a very practical level. Yeah. But how do we not stay in our silos of right. our, you know, like who we, at, who we naturally know? Yeah. And, you know, looking Thank at you. who's balanced in the room, how can we really, if we're, everyone is our bonobo sister, how do we do that on a okay. practical level? Thank you both, that was great. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick two-part answer. The first thing is to rethink equality. We always think about gender equality and sex equality in terms of how women are measuring up to men as if men are a legitimate standard for whom we should be measured up against. Rethink that. Our Constitution is, and I outlined this in eight and nine, chapters eight and nine, but what if we say all women are created equal, and then all women take the, their own inventory of our own privileges, and then figure out affirmatively how to share them with our sisters. No matter who your sister is, if you're related to her, if you know her, anything. What, whatever patriarchal divisions we've been taught about our sisters, She's not my skin color, she's not my religion, she's not my geographic region. Forget about it, that just helps patriarchy. Okay, the second thing is that I have started the Bonobo Sisterhood Alliance and my chief Bonobo officer, 
and Twin Flame. Um, Cindy Kahn is in the back there, um, who came in from California and has helped enormously with this event and helps me with everything, um, and other bonobos and family members in the audience. But through that, it's not my book. It's out in the world. It's your book. You do what you want with it. You don't need my permission. You don't need anyone's permission. You form sisterhoods. You form alliances with people that you wouldn't think you would ask to be in your alliance, like Amanda does. She's like, yeah, you're going to look me in the eye, and you're going to tell me you're not going to vote for my bill. And they're like, mm, well, no, did we say that? We didn't mean that. <laughs> we, we didn't mean that. And, and just get to a human level and invite human people into your alliance. People are basically good and helpful and loving, and we need to get back to that. So, so you don't need my permission. I'm happy to facilitate bonobo sisterhoods all over the world for sure. Um, but just go and do it. Be imaginative. You, you just can't believe what happens when you put people together. Like when I first met Amanda, and, and it, Amanda is so like lovable, and I introduced her to like five students, and they all fell in love with her, and they're like, oh, we got you. We got you. And that's, that was like one of the iterations of the Bonobo Sisterhood. And then when Ashley was sitting in my class, and I just have to tell this quick story about Ashley, <laughs> if I may. And, um, and Ashley sent out an email to the class, because she was at the Kennedy School, and these were law students, and she wanted to make sure she wasn't missing anything, because this child has a brain. Like, I don't have to tell you. You've already witnessed it, and you've witnessed it for years. So she sends out an email and said, um, anybody want um, a study group on Saturdays? Because I'm reading these cases, and I want to make sure that I'm understanding them. And then the next email, four minutes later to the class, was, well, that filled up lickety-split. <laughs> But she just, in her own quiet bonobo way, was just in the class participating, like teaching and being an example and a shining light for us. And just be bonobo. Be yourself. These are, I, I love everybody here, and especially these. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. <laughs> we have to wrap up. And now I'll stop. <laughs> no. But before we do, I think there's somebody really um, yeah. important that I want to recognize. Me too. Um, Actually, first, thank you guys for your questions. And for those of you who didn't have a chance to ask, please come on up afterwards. And, and I'm sorry if I cut you off. Um, a longtime supporter of the museum, Malcolm here in the front row, raise your hand, say hi. And his wife, Carol, came to us last spring and said, I have hope. And I was like, well, tell me more. And Malcolm introduced me to Diane's book. We immediately sent the book to many of our donors. And he said, how can we spread this message further? And that's what started this conversation, the development of this panel. And I really want to thank you, Malcolm, for always asking the question, not only how are we all going to fit on this planet, but also how can we do better. Thank you, and thank Carol. Thank you both for making tonight possible, for bringing all of us together, and for encouraging us to spread the message of the Bonobo Sisterhood. Thank you. Hey, I hope you guys have enjoyed this conversation. For those of you guys who are staying a little bit later, we'll be downstairs for the VIP reception. But if you would like to ask a few more questions, by all means, come on up, say hi. And thank you for coming and braving the traffic. Thank, thank you, you guys. So much. Thank you. That was great. You so did.